What's up, guys? Welcome back to Newswave. So when you know it, yesterday, as soon as Newswave went up, a teardown from Sony for the PlayStation 5 system went up on YouTube. I got a chance to check it out. Actually did a longer video checking out their video on the second channel, though, as they did a teardown of it. But we're gonna go over some of the big things from that teardown and some big questions that have now been answered by it. Also, we get to talk a bit about Sega as they did their Game Gear Mini. They're apparently working or at least thinking about plans for the next plug and play system. And uh, they brought up the Dreamcast Mini. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if you're brand new here, hit the red subscribe button down below as we head towards 500,000 subscribers. And we're gonna start today with an update for the PlayStation Trophy system on your PlayStation 4 currently, but also of course going towards the PlayStation 5 releasing next month. There was a full blog post put out on Sony's site, you can see here. And how they describe this is essentially, the, the trophy level range will be altering heavily. So it's gonna go from the current one to 100 to one to 999. So they say following this update, your trophy level will automatically be remapped to a new level within this new range based on the trophies you've earned to date. For example, if your current trophy level is 12, your new level will jump to somewhere in the low 200s and the idea here is that you will be, of course, leveling up more because it's easier to reach each level, which will, of course, pull you along more to play more games with that kind of instant gratification rather than having to slowly watch a bar fill up to eventually at that level, it should be much more frequent for that to happen, which is good. They also announced that there'll be several new icons and all of this. So it's just them kind of working out some of their trophy stuff, heading towards the PlayStation 5. And look, trophies and achievements are big pulls for a lot of people. It's, it kind of wore down on me a little bit back in the day. The achievement hunter in me was, was really big into it for the 360, but I don't know. It just kind of fell out a bit for me when it comes to that, but really cool to see this. Again, it'd be fun to see where you even land. If you haven't turned your PS4 on yet today, go ahead and turn it on and see what your new trophy level is because that update went live last night. Also, there are two games currently on the Switch that uh, we think are coming out this year, but we haven't heard a lot about them. And after Tokyo Game Show, I'm a bit concerned about Bravely Default 2 and uh, well, Doom Eternal on the Switch isn't exactly showing up anywhere right now. But check this out on Twitter. Someone actually spotted that a game retailer online, Gameware, just changed the release date of Bravely Default 2 from 2020 to 2021 and Doom Eternal for Switch from 2020 to second quarter of 2021. And it, it's it's tough because Bravely Default 2 could sneak in in December. We had that demo, there's a lot of feedback given and it played, I, th I thought, pretty well. And I was very hopeful that 2020 would still have Bravely Default 2 in it, but I'm becoming less and less confident about that. And uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Bravely Default 2 ended up being like a February release instead of a December release. Just maybe they got pushed back due to, of course, remote work and the situation around COVID-19, all of this stuff kind of throwing things into flux with development. But there's still a little bit of time. However, if we get into November and there's no talk of Bravely Default 2 yet, I wouldn't count on it showing up this year. And then Doom Eternal on the Switch, who knows? It's been a long time since we've heard anything really tangible about that game. Also, we of course know right now there is one option for expandable storage for the Xbox Series S and the Xbox Series X, and that is that little memory card from Seagate. So there have been some concerns around pricing, basically staying the same since they're just using one manufacturer and there's one option. Well, check this out right here. This is from Jason Ronald, who says, I think over time you'll see this, this is a category that's really critical to us. You'll see multiple options and different form factors and different sizes. But what was really important for us is that we had a simple, easy to use option available day one. You can expect to see more options moving forward. That is on the expandable storage memory card. This is good news. This of course is done from Seagate and I assume they probably have some sort of deal set up with Microsoft to be the launch day expandable storage for the system. They will then just sell more overall because of that, right? It could be a one year deal even. And then after the first year, we start seeing other companies, maybe Western Digital, as an example, pop up to provide uh, an NVMe memory card for the Xbox Series X and S. I'm hoping that's sooner rather than later because getting some competition in there rather than have to rely on just one brand for that card wouldn't be great, especially since Sony is gonna basically allow you to pick which one you want. 
However, there will be guidelines that will have to fall into, and hopefully we get that list pretty soon there. But uh, looking forward to see what other memory cards, especially form factor wise, that we can get for the Series X and S. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get in the bigger stuff. We're starting right away with that PlayStation 5 teardown video that was put out. It was a little over seven minutes. Sony just dropped it in the morning pretty much out of nowhere. We were expecting this because they did it with the PlayStation 4 Pro to kind of show off the insides of that. And there was so much curiosity around the PS5 because of the form factor, obviously, but to see how it was cooled and we were hearing Mark Cerny talk about kind of the engineering behind it and how we'll be really happy to see how they managed to cool the system. Well, they sat down and they took all of it apart to show off the different things like the heatsink, of course, the SSD, and that APU inside. But we're gonna go over this as we move forward here, starting with the stand on the bottom. This came up a lot online. It does appear that you will need a screwdriver, specifically a flathead, when you first take it out of the box so you can screw in the stand on the bottom or have it clipped to the side of the PlayStation 5. It's, it's hard to say how it will come in the box because the system will need the stand attached either way. It, it can't just sit without it. So you're either gonna screw it into the bottom or you're gonna clip it into the side. And the stand is a bit more complex than I thought it would be. There's a space for the screw, which will go missing anyway. It's, it's gonna happen. They, they give you a little space to organize it but trust me from what I've seen in the real world, in retail, when people bring in their stuff for trading, they're always missing something. And I think that screw is gonna be one of the big things. I am curious why they didn't have a toolless option. Usually you can have something that will swing out next to the screw and just kind of gives you a way to leverage with your hand to unscrew it or tighten it. It's very odd because I don't think that screw has to be extremely tight for the stand to hold. Anyway, from there, we do have the side panels that come off. People are hoping that means that there will be some sort of big custom side blowout from Sony where they just continue to release different shells over and over again for the system, right? Like the Spider-Man, oh, limited edition Spider-Man shell, limited edition God of War, Horizon, the list goes on for what people would want. However, my thought with this is it's just easier for them out of the factory to now produce those limited edition systems because they just, clip right on. Now it's great that they can do this for people since there is a spot where you can vacuum out the dirt and dust and that was one of the biggest issues and causes for overheating with systems. That was nice to see. And we got a look at the M.2 NVMe that will be going in the space for it. Looks like it supports all different sizes. Again, a good thing there for more options. And I'll be curious to see what the overall, what the overall room is in there because Mark Cerny mentioned about heat sinks possibly getting in the way. And that is something that probably will come up. Again, we're gonna have to basically make our own little list of the best SSD to buy for this system. Now, after removing this massive fan, which won't have to spin very fast to move air through the system, they then show off the heat sink and the board itself, along with the APU that is covered in liquid metal. And this was really interesting because it seems like they've been working this out for a little while now. Liquid metal will generally stay liquidy. So it will move and shift inside of the system. It looks like they have two different barriers set up on that chip. One is that large amount of foam. The other one seems to be kind of a cap on top of the chip as well. And as soon as it all closes up against that massive heatsink, the, the liquid metal should be able to just kind of stay there, which is good because if it gets out, it's not gonna be good. It is very conductive and can even kind of corrode different metals and all of this. But I have to say, from what they showed here, I was very impressed with it. The engineering looks good and the overall internals of it look higher quality than even I was expecting that heat sink. We heard about them going for a more expensive solution to cool the system down. Well, there it is. It is this behemoth of a heat sink. Now, of course, that means that the system itself is massive as well. And it was pretty obvious when he was sitting next to it with the on the table right next to him. Yeah, it's a big system, but there is purpose behind it. And that's the best part. It's not just big to be big. It's big so that it can be quiet and mostly cool to the touch because those panels are not actually the part that's gonna get hot. The inside, kind of that all black casing, is what will get hot, but you'll never touch that. So overall, this is a very good design from Sony to try to put a very hot chip, because they clocked that thing at 2.23 gigahertz. It's not gonna be cold, okay? This is, this is gonna put some heat out, but they made it work within this thin kind of tower design rather than going to more of a traditional box tower that Microsoft did with their Series X. Now we'll have to see how all of this does in the wild out there with millions of people getting the system and dropping in their entertainment center and really putting it through its paces, but 
From what we saw with that teardown, it looked pretty good overall, and I'm very happy with what they showed us. Next up, let's talk about Sega and their mini consoles or their plug and play systems, of course. You know what, they, they got it right with that Genesis mini, right? I, I think it was good, but I think for the most part, based on what we had with at games, this was significantly better, but then they show us this Game Gear mini and it's tiny, it's smaller than a VMU. Okay, sure, I guess. What's next though? Because we all know what we want from Sega. We want that Dreamcast Mini, don't we? Well, it seems that Sega had a, an article in Famitsu where they were talking about their next mini system, and we have some excerpts from it here. For the next mini, we are considering everything that has been imagined by everyone. Of course, it doesn't mean we can realize all of them. We are also thinking about projects that nobody has imagined. The projects are moved by a substantial amount of money, so we're working first on the one that, realistically speaking, has the highest possibility. The Game Gear Micro is only sold domestically in Japan. When we do the next one, I feel like like the project scope will be much bigger as we gaze upon the world, so we won't be able to release it at this time, the next year, or two years after the Mega Drive Mini. We can't make it that quickly. I think for the next one, we may go with a concept close to the Mega Drive Mini. If I have to say some names, it could be an SG-1000 Mini or a Dreamcast Mini. Oh, they're really gonna do it. They're gonna make an SG-1000 Mini when everybody wants the Dreamcast Mini. Sega. What are you doing? Just make a Dreamcast Mini. Okay, there there are probably some issues with that, okay? Let's be realistic for at least a second here, whether it is the emulation of it, uh, the cost of the chipset, the flash memory, all these different things that would go into it, but I think they could charge a little more than $100 to make it happen. Keep in mind though that PlayStation 1 Classic appears to be able to play Dreamcast games with its current chipset, so maybe they could go with something along that. I feel like they learned a lot from that Genesis Mini that they could apply to a Dreamcast Mini. And I hope that's something they have in mind, especially if they go with the worldwide launch. Like if you announce an SG-1000, a lot of people are just gonna look around and say, what's that exactly? Like there's no, there's no power behind that name. Whereas if you say Dreamcast Mini, yeah, that's gonna spread all over the internet. People will be so excited about it. There'll probably be videos, articles, tons of stuff happening. And of course, then we'll start probably scrutinizing the list that they put out for the games. But like, take your time and just make a Dreamcast Mini as things become more viable to do so, whether it's the chips or the flash memory, whatever's holding it up, just kind of hang out and work on it because when that day comes and they do hopefully unveil a Dreamcast Mini, I'll be there right away to pre-order one. And uh, you know what? I think a lot of other people will too. Also, here's a good question. How much would you pay for a Dreamcast Mini? Like let's say Sega's looking around, they're like, we can't make this thing for anything less than 150. Would you go up to 150 for a Dreamcast Mini that had a solid number of games? I'm not like, not even like 20 uh, okay games, like 20 solid games maybe 30 solid games. What do, you, what do you think about a price tag like that? Next up, let's talk about the Nintendo Treehouse that took place yesterday. We saw two games there, Pikmin 3 Deluxe, that's gonna be out at the end of this month. And then we had Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity that's out next month in November. And both of them look pretty good. Most, I think, tuned in for Age of Calamity because Pikmin 3 Deluxe is a Wii U port. However, they did show off some new features which included the co-op mode, which is really cool to see because I think it's like 14 or 15 minutes in they switched over to it and it looks like you can just you can just play the whole game I guess in co-op which is great they showed off gyro functionality also a welcomed addition and guess what you can play the game right now because they put a demo out on the on the eShop and they put this tweet out alongside of it. A demo for Pikmin 3 Deluxe will be available this evening on Nintendo eShop. The demo version features save data transfer with the full game. Completing it also gives immediate access to the ultra spicy difficult mode in the full game and other perks. Wow, so this is, I like seeing this more and more and it seems to be happening a lot on the Switch in particular, right? We've seen different demos come out and then your saves will transfer over to the full game. It gives you a head start. You know what? It gives you that, that thought in the back of your head like, yeah, you know what, I already started it. Maybe I should go pick this game up. And of course, it's just more people who may look on the eShop and just try it just to try it. I, I think it's good. And the fact that you unlock a harder difficulty mode when you complete the demo and other features, 
Very, very good idea by Nintendo. So go check that demo out if you have not yet. And then we saw roughly 20 minutes or so of Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. And I gotta tell you, I'm just ready for this game to come out. I think I've seen enough. They showed plenty of gameplay for it. And yes, it is a warrior style game. I get it, it's not for everyone, but like, it looks like they're going to just be telling a massive story alongside of it. And there was some new information there, but it was mostly just showing us a bunch of gameplay. And that's what I like to see. They just sit down and they just play the game, right? But there are a few extra things here and you can see some of that gameplay right here. For example, Hidden Koroks will return. So they showed uh, one or two in the levels that will be just kind of hidden and you go through and they'll pop up as you find them. And one of the big ones, because this, this was gonna come up, weapons won't break. That's great because they broke a lot in Breath of the Wild and it was really, really annoying. And in this one, with how much you were swinging your weapon around and hitting all kinds of enemies, that would have also gotten annoying as well. So good to see there. Again, the game just looks great. I'm just ready for it to come out and play it. I think it's gonna be significantly better than just Hyrule Warriors that we've had already because this looks like a bigger focus on the story and even the world itself, visuals, everything. So looking forward to that next month, but go check out the gameplay if you missed it yesterday. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Monster Hunter Rise, Capcom, and the Switch Pro apparently, because one thing that seems to be coming up is some are having a hard time believing with how good Monster Hunter Rise looks that it's not running on Switch hardware that we have currently. Some are wondering if Capcom may have the in there with Nintendo. It's coming out at the end of March and people are like, oh, maybe, that's when the Switch Pro could be coming out alongside of those rumors that we would see it in the first half of next year. It kind of adds up, right? Well, Capcom was asked about this and this is what they had to say. It was all running on Switch, everything you saw at TGS. And they respond, I know you won't be able to talk to Nintendo's plans at all, but I find it interesting that there's a lot of quite high profile titles coming out next March and speculation about a new Switch. If in theory there was a new Switch, would you be well positioned to kind of take advantage of that? And then they respond, well, obviously we have no idea whatsoever what the plans would be in that direction. But even at the moment, you actually have two different Switch hardwares you're targeting. You've got the original Switch, which has the docking mode. So that's something we've already borne in mind to make sure that the game isn't making any undue assumptions on the hardware owned by the player. As to those kind of plans on Nintendo side, we can't speak to those at all. We're trying to make the game work as best as it can on whatever Switch you have. Hmm. So Capcom, of course, is going to say that. They're not gonna say, oh yeah, we have the Switch Pro right now. It's, it's out, we have it at the office. Do you, wanna, do you wanna come by and check it out? That's not gonna happen. Even if they really had any type of knowledge, they wouldn't just come out and say it in an interview. I, I know people will try to get them to stumble and, and slip up a bit and maybe mention something, uh, but this wasn't necessarily a clear cut no, like we don't have any knowledge. They say, oh, we don't know their plans going forward necessarily, but that could mean there is Switch Pro and we don't know what their plans are for it going forward. Now, the rumors will continue until uh, Nintendo, of course, has any type of hint towards it. And that could be in some sort of investors meeting or briefing or something there, right? But most likely Nintendo won't announce a Pro until a month before the Pro is coming out. So it'll be a little while. It definitely won't be before the holiday or during the holiday. The earliest I think Nintendo could announce it would be in January, but I'm gonna lean more towards if it's coming out in March, wait until February to find out about it. Also from Capcom, I'd be super flattered for people to tell me that they can't believe that Monster Hunter Rise is running on a Switch because of how good it looks. I mean, that, that, that's a compliment, right? And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Joe saying, 3D audio, haptic feedback, adaptive triggers. It feels like PlayStation is trying to create as close to a VR experience without actually wearing the headset. I, I think a lot of that will also play into the PlayStation VR 2. There are talks that they could uh, unveil that next year. And that makes sense. They, they are technically the leaders when it comes to virtual reality headsets. So they would be the ones to announce the PlayStation VR 2, and that would probably become the best-selling headset there as well. So looking at this, I think the biggest thing is though, we're getting close to where visuals just aren't blowing people away from generation to generation. So you're gonna have things like advanced haptic feedback, 3D audio, things just outside of, look how shiny these graphics look, right? That was something we had before, not necessarily now. So that's what I think is happening more or less here is we'll see more and more things that get away from just the way games look 
and trying to immerse you other ways. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit the like button, really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. Whether it's that PlayStation 5 teardown, did anything there surprise you like that massive heat sink or just how large the system is itself sitting next to the guy at the table. And then what about a Dreamcast Mini? How much would you pay for, we'll say a good Dreamcast Mini? And then do you think Capcom knows anything about the Switch Pro and they're just trying to play dumb right now as they work through Monster Rise? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.